Well, here we are again, and this is our 32nd expedition under the project Caving the Boat of the Clouds. Uh, to introduce myself, I am Brian Dermot Carpet Daly uh, from Shillong. We started this project, in, actually we formed this issue in 1990 and started caving from the year 1992. Probably it's destiny that uh, Simon, a small group of British cavers happened to come to Megla and visit the same cave that we had visited earlier. Uh, this came to my knowledge and uh, I tried to trace them out and through the tourism department and met up with Simon two years later. And since then, we have been organizing these ex expeditions, which has uh, benefited us in terms of expertise and equipment and the foreign cavers uh, in terms of logistics. And so it's been a long way and we have discovered many many caves over 1700 caves and uh, many more yet to be discovered so my name is dr mark tringham i'm a geologist and i'm Delighted to come again on the Megalea caving expedition for about the 13th season. I'm a retired geologist. I graduated in geology as a student in England, uh, where I'm from, and I did a PhD in structural geology. Of particular interest to me in Megalea are the very big, very extensive cave systems with many interesting geological features. Uh, a general introduction uh, to karst terrain. Karst is a term used for a, t a terrain where solution of carbonate rocks is the dominant erosional process. And uh, here we're dealing with limestone, which is slightly soluble rock, and rainwater uh, in copious amounts of megalayer during the wet season. When raindrops fall through the sky, they absorb small amounts of carbon dioxide and form a uh, slightly acidic solution uh, of carbonic acid. Uh, this has the capability of um, seeping into cracks in the limestone and starting the solution process. We see this on the surface with uh, rock pinnacles and in large cracks. Quite quickly, preferred channels for water develop and caves begin to form with this uh, solution process. Uh, especially so where you have high rainfall, um, moderate temperatures and high, high elevation of the terrain. So uh, the water falls uh, from the sky, uh, descends into cracks and uh, in the end cave entrances and the dominant drainage is below the ground and we see springs down in the valley bottoms and uh, open shafts in this area uh, in the upland areas of the limestone. Uh, we see um, a lot of fossils in the rocks, we see structures, uh, in particular wrench type faults and nearby here in uh, one of the limestone layers we see a notable paleocast horizon that formed during the Paleocene period around 53 million years ago. Here at Mulian, we're dealing with the formation called the Prang limestone, which is about 140 meters thick. And typically the cave entrances uh, are near the top of the limestone and descend quickly 
through most of the limestone thickness and we get river passages, uh, stream passages towards the base of the limestone 100 to 140 meters below. It's a great privilege to be able to explore new caves. Many of them are very beautiful with uh, speleothems, that's the technical word for uh, cave formations, stalactites, stalagmites, flowstone, gua pools, uh, they can be very beautiful. Uh, the stream passages themselves can be very beautiful, large. passages, interesting shapes, cascades, waterfalls, a whole range of uh, scenery underground that's a great privilege to be able to explore and um, help out determine what is here, what the hydrology is doing, how the caves formed and what we can find inside them. My name is Shirish Manchi. I work with uh, Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and Natural History, Coimbatore. I'm basically an ornithologist. You can say I do ornithospeleology, but then I got into cave biology and uh, it was very fascinating for me, like doing something which very few people in this country do. The caves in Meghalaya are quite different than whatever explored caves in this country. We are proud to have the longest sandstone cave in the world. This actually gives a big credit to India. This gives a big credit to the uh, Meghalayan cave expedition team. And we also recently have our uh, Indian Prime Minister declared the, one of the cave as a UNESCO heritage site in Meghalaya. As we uh, look into the uniqueness, the largest cave fish in the world is discovered from this place. And not only that, now there are several other things which we observed during the expedition, like there are some other fishes, there are some crabs, there is a good diversity which is still unexplored. And if explored, it can really have a high conservation value and high scientific uh, significance in the world of biology because of their special adaptations uh, like losing of coloration, losing of eyes, developing different sensory organs and it gives us a very, very important or very significant idea of how evolution occurs, how how things change, how animals adapt to different conditions. And I say exploring more and more Megalian caves and especially the fauna in them is very interesting and is very significant for a scientific understanding of how these things happen. So I'm Jox Burgers from the Netherlands and with my team I'm responsible for the digital map. One day a genius guy from Switzerland uh, had the idea to make the Disto X. So he took uh, a device that it normally only takes measurements, a length, but now it was also possible to do compass and plino. And it had Bluetooth to uh, a PDA, so you can sketch with a stylo on the PDA. Remember. To do that, the, the Disto X has to be calibrated, and you do it by making uh, four measurements like this, four measurements like this, four like this, four like this, four like this, and four like this. And every time you rotate the device a quarter. So we have a lot of measurements. You can uh, see it on the PDA, you know, we had the connection with the PDA and it will tell you if you did it successfully. 
and then the calibration can be transferred back to the device so it will continue doing good measurements. And that's calibration. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Nix from the UK. I started taking photographs in caves on my early caving trips. As time went on, I started pursuing cave photography to a greater extent to make uh, better pictures using equipment available at the time. Years went by and the equipment progressed, but the basic techniques have never really changed. For creating a good photograph, it's all about seeing the image in your mind and trying to work out how you wish to light it, or not as the case may be. Various photographs can be taken in different ways. Some are more complex and more tricky than others. All depend on the, uh, the help and willingness of the volunteers who, co who come to uh, assist, or even maybe just people on the trip, who you'll say, please, can you hold this flash gun and point it in this direction? So it is not I that make the photograph, it is the team, we make the photograph. So to create a good photograph, the detail is important to have the chance to document, particularly a cave that might, may never been seen by human eyes before, is absolutely superb. Caves are a living environment, so they're always changing, and your eye for a photograph always changes. Cave photography is never easy. Technology is advanced so that People can get really pretty and interesting shots with very light equipment, such as a, a really good phone camera. I sometimes think, why do I lug all this heavy kit around the hillside? But when you're sat uh, sifting through your photographs, you think, yes, this is why we, we, we've done that. A caver's light only shows what is in front of them. And sometimes we've taken pictures of things and noticed detail that we hadn't necessarily seen. What appears to the human eye appears totally different on uh, behind the lens. Say hello. 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 Into the edge of the water. Yeah. We did. Uh, a lot of visitors today. <laughs> <laughs>